Chapter forty seven, part five of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. One. Both in his native and his episcopal province, the heresy of the unfortunate Nestorius was speedily obliterated. The Oriental bishops, who at Ephesus had resisted to his face the arrogance of Cyril, were mollified by his tardy concessions. The same prelates, or their successors, subscribed, not without a murmur, the decrees of Chalcedon. The power of the Monophysites reconciled them with the Catholics in the conformity of passion, of interest, and insensibly of belief, and their last reluctant sigh was breathed in the defence of the three chapters. Their dissenting brethren, less moderate or more sincere, were crushed by the penal laws, and as early as the reign of Justinian it became difficult to find a church of Nestorians within the limits of the Roman Empire. Beyond those limits they had discovered a new world, in which they might hope for liberty and aspire to conquest. In Persia, notwithstanding the resistance of the Magi, Christianity had struck a deep root and the nations of the East reposed under its salutary shade. The Catholic, or primate, resided in the capital. In his synods, and in their dioceses, his metropolitans, bishops, and clergy represented the pomp and order of a regular hierarchy. They rejoiced in the increase of proselytes, who were converted from the Zendavesta to the Gospel, from the secular to the monastic life, and their zeal was stimulated by the presence of an artful and formidable enemy. The Persian church had been founded by the missionaries of Syria, and their language, discipline, and doctrine were closely interwoven with its original frame. The Catholics were elected and ordained by their own suffragans, but their filial dependence on the patriarchs of Antioch is attested by the canons of the Oriental Church. In the Persian school of Edessa, the rising generations of the faithful imbibed their theological idiom. They studied in the Syriac version the ten thousand volumes of Theodore of Mopsuestia, and they revered the apostolic faith and holy martyrdom of his disciple Nestorius, whose person and language were equally unknown to the nations beyond the Tigris. The first indelible lesson of Ebas, bishop of Edessa, taught them to execrate the Egyptians, who, in the synod of Ephesus, had impiously confounded the two natures of Christ— the flight of the masters and scholars who were twice expelled from the Athens of Syria, dispersed a crowd of missionaries, inflamed by the double zeal of religion and revenge. And the rigid unity of the Monophysites, who under the reigns of Zeno and Anastasius had invaded the thrones of the East, provoked their antagonists in a land of freedom to avow a moral rather than a physical union of the two persons of Christ. Since the first preaching of the gospel, the Sassanian kings beheld with an eye of suspicion a race of aliens and apostates who had embraced the religion and who might favour the cause of the hereditary foes of their country. The royal edicts had often prohibited their dangerous correspondence with the Syrian clergy. The progress of the schism was grateful to the jealous pride of Perozes and he listened to the eloquence of an artful prelate who painted Nestorius as the friend of Persia, and urged him to secure the fidelity of his Christian subjects by granting a just preference to the victims and enemies of the Roman tyrant. The Nestorians composed a large majority of the clergy and people. They were encouraged by the smile and armed with the sword of despotism, Yet many of their weaker brethren were startled at the thought of breaking loose from the communion of the Christian world, and the blood of seven thousand seven hundred Monophysites, or Catholics, confirmed the uniformity of faith and discipline in the churches of Persia. Their ecclesiastical institutions are distinguished by a liberal principle of reason, or at least of policy. The austerity of the cloister was relaxed and gradually forgotten, Houses of charity were endowed for the education of orphans and foundlings. The law of celibacy, so forcibly recommended to the Greeks and Latins, was disregarded by the Persian clergy, and the number of the elect was multiplied by the public and reiterated nuptials of the priests 
the bishops, and even the patriarch himself. To this standard of natural and religious freedom, myriads of fugitives resorted from all the provinces of the Eastern Empire. The narrow bigotry of Justinian was punished by the emigration of his most industrious subjects. They transported into Persia the arts both of peace and war, and those who deserved the favour were promoted in the service of a discerning monarch. The arms of Nushirvan and his fiercer grandson were assisted with advice and money and troops by the desperate sectaries who still lurked in their native cities of the East. Their zeal was rewarded with the gift of the Catholic churches, but when those cities and churches were recovered by Heraclius, their open profession of treason and heresy compelled them to seek a refuge in the realm of their foreign ally. But the seeming tranquillity of the Nestorians was often endangered and sometimes overthrown. They were involved in the common evils of Oriental despotism, their enmity to Rome could not always atone for their attachment to the Gospel, and a colony of three hundred thousand Jacobites, the captives of Apamia and Antioch, was permitted to erect a hostile altar in the face of the Catholic and in the sunshine of the court. In his last treaty, Justinian introduced some conditions which tended to enlarge and fortify the toleration of Christianity in Persia. The emperor, ignorant of the rights of conscience, was incapable of pity or esteem for the heretics who denied the authority of the holy synods, but he flattered himself that they would gradually perceive the temporal benefits of union with the empire and the church of Rome, and if he failed in exciting their gratitude, he might hope to provoke the jealousy of their sovereign. In a later age, the Lutherans have been burnt at Paris and protected in Germany by the superstition and policy of the most Christian king. The desire of gaining souls for God and subjects for the church has excited in every age the diligence of the Christian priests. From the conquest of Persia they carried their spiritual arms to the north, the east and the south, and the simplicity of the gospel was fashioned and painted with the colours of the Syriac theology. In the sixth century, according to the report of a Nestorian traveller, Christianity was successfully preached to the Bactrians, the Huns, the Persians, the Indians, the Persarmenians, the Medes and the Elamites. The barbaric churches from the Gulf of Persia to the Caspian Sea were almost infinite, and their recent faith was conspicuous in the number and sanctity of their monks and martyrs. The pepper coast of Malabar, and the isles of the ocean, Socotora and Ceylon, were peopled with an increasing multitude of Christians, and the bishops and clergy of those sequestered regions derived their ordination from the Catholic of Babylon. In a subsequent age the zeal of the Nestorians overleaped the limits which had confined the ambition and curiosity both of the Greeks and Persians. The missionaries of Balch and Samarkand pursued without fear the footsteps of the roving Tartar, and insinuated themselves into the camps of the valleys of Emmaus and the banks of the Selinga. They exposed a metaphysical creed to those illiterate shepherds. To those sanguinary warriors they recommended humanity and repose. Yet a Khan, whose power they vainly magnified, is said to have received at their hands the rites of baptism and even of ordination, and the fame of Prester or Presbyter John has long amused the credulity of Europe. The royal convert was indulged in the use of a portable altar, but he dispatched an embassy to the patriarch to inquire how, in the season of Lent, he should abstain from animal food, and how he might celebrate the Eucharist in a desert that produced neither corn nor wine. In their progress by sea and land, the Nestorians entered China by the port of Canton and the northern residence of Sigan. Unlike the senators of Rome, who assumed with a smile the characters of priests and augurs, the mandarins, who affect in public the reason of philosophers, are devoted in private to every mode of popular superstition. They cherished and they confounded the gods of Palestine and of India. But the propagation of Christianity awakened the jealousy of the state, and after a short vicissitude of favour and persecution, the foreign sect expired in ignorance and oblivion. Under the reign of the Caliphs, the Nestorian church was diffused from China to Jerusalem and Cyrus, and their numbers, with those of the Jacobites, were computed to surpass the Greek and Latin communions. 
Twenty-five metropolitans or archbishops composed their hierarchy, but several of these were dispensed, by the distance and danger of the way, from the duty of personal attendance, on the easy condition that every six years they should testify their faith and obedience to the Catholic or Patriarch of Babylon, a vague appellation which has been successively applied to the royal seats of Seleucia, Ctesiphon, and Baghdad. These remote branches are long since withered, and the old patriarchal trunk is now divided by the Elijahs of Mosul, the representatives almost on lineal descent of the genuine and primitive succession, the Josephs of Amida, who are reconciled to the Church of Rome, and the Simeons of Van or Ormia, whose revolt, at the head of forty thousand families, was promoted in the sixteenth century by the Sophies of Persia. The number of three hundred thousand is allowed for the whole body of the Nestorians, who, under the name of Chaldeans or Assyrians, are confounded with the most learned or the most powerful nation of Eastern antiquity. According to the legend of antiquity, the gospel was preached in India by St. Thomas. At the end of the ninth century, his shrine, perhaps in the neighbourhood of Madras, was devoutly visited by the ambassadors of Alfred, and their return with a cargo of pearls and spices rewarded the zeal of the English monarch who entertained the largest projects of trade and discovery. When the Portuguese first opened the navigation of India, the Christians of St. Thomas had been seated for ages on the coast of Malabar, and the difference of their character and colour attested the mixture of a foreign race. In arms, in arts, and possibly in virtue, they excelled the natives of Hindustan. The husbandmen cultivated the palm-tree, the merchants were enriched by the pepper-trade, the soldiers preceded the nayas or nobles of Malabar, and their hereditary privileges were respected by the gratitude or the fear of the king of Cochin and the Zamorin himself. They acknowledged a gentoo sovereign, but they were governed even in temporal concerns by the bishop of Angamala. He still asserted his ancient title of Metropolitan of India, but his real jurisdiction was exercised in fourteen hundred churches, and he was entrusted with the care of two hundred thousand souls. Their religion would have rendered them the firmest and most cordial allies of the Portuguese, but the inquisitors soon discerned in the Christians of St. Thomas the unpardonable guilt of heresy and schism. Instead of owning themselves the subjects of the Roman pontiff, the spiritual and temporal monarch of the globe, they adhered like their ancestors to the communion of the Nestorian patriarch, and the bishops whom he ordained at Mosul traversed the dangers of the sea and land to reach their diocese on the coast of Malabar. In their Syriac liturgy the names of Theodore and Nestorius were piously commemorated. They united their adoration of the two persons of Christ, the title of Mother of God was offensive to their ear, and they measured with scrupulous avarice the honours of the Virgin Mary, whom the superstition of the Latins had almost exalted to the rank of a goddess. When her image was first presented to the disciples of St. Thomas, they indignantly exclaimed, We are Christians, not idolaters and their simple devotion was content with the veneration of the cross. Their separation from the Western world had left them in ignorance of the improvements, or corruptions, of a thousand years, and their conformity with the faith and practice of the fifth century would equally disappoint the prejudices of a papist or a protestant. It was the first care of the ministers of Rome to intercept all correspondence with the Nestorian patriarch, and several of his bishops expired in the prisons of the Holy Office. The flock, without a shepherd, was assaulted by the power of the Portuguese, the arts of the Jesuits, and the zeal of Alexis de Menezes, Archbishop of Goa, in his personal visitation of the coast of Malabar. The Synod of Diampa, at which he presided, consummated the pious work of the reunion, and rigorously imposed the doctrine and discipline of the Roman Church, without forgetting auricular confession, the strongest engine of ecclesiastical torture. The memory of Theodore and Nestorius was condemned, and Malabar was reduced under the dominion of the Pope, of the Primate, and of the Jesuits, who invaded the Sea of Angamala or Cranganor. Sixty years of servitude and hypocrisy were patiently endured, but as soon as the Portuguese Empire was shaken by the courage and industry of the Dutch, 
the Nestorians asserted with vigour and effect the religion of their fathers. The Jesuits were incapable of defending the power which they had abused. The arms of forty thousand Christians were pointed against their falling tyrants, and the Indian archdeacon assumed the character of bishop till a fresh supply of episcopal gifts and Syriac missionaries could be obtained from the patriarch of Babylon. Since the expulsion of the Portuguese, the Nestorian creed is freely professed on the coast of Malabar. The trading companies of Holland and England are the friends of toleration, but if oppression be less mortifying than contempt, the Christians of St. Thomas have reason to complain of the cold and silent indifference of their brethren of Europe. 2. The history of the Monophysites is less copious and interesting than that of the Nestorians. Under the reigns of Zeno and Anastasius, their artful leaders surprised the ear of the prince, usurped the thrones of the East, and crushed on its native soil the school of the Syrians. The rule of the Monophysite faith was defined with exquisite discretion by Severus, patriarch of Antioch. He condemned in the style of the Henoticon the adverse heresies of Nestorius, and Eutyches maintained against the latter the reality of the body of Christ, and constrained the Greeks to allow that he was a liar who spoke truth. But the approximation of ideas could not abate the vehemence of passion. Each party was the more astonished that their blind antagonist could dispute on so trifling a difference. The tyrant of Syria enforced the belief of his creed, and his reign was polluted with the blood of three hundred and fifty monks, who were slain, not perhaps without provocation or resistance, under the walls of Apamea. The successor of Anastasius replanted the orthodox standard in the east. Severus fled into Egypt, and his friend, the eloquent Zenaeus, who had escaped from the Nestorians of Persia, was suffocated in his exile by the Melkites of Paphlagonia. Fifty-four bishops were swept from their thrones, eight hundred ecclesiastics were cast into prison, and notwithstanding the ambiguous favour of Theodora, the oriental flocks, deprived of their shepherds, must insensibly have been either famished or poisoned. In this spiritual distress, the expiring faction was revived and united and perpetuated by the labours of a monk, and the name of James Baradeus has been preserved in the appellation of Jacobites, a familiar sound which may startle the ear of an English reader. From the holy confessors in their prison of Constantinople he received the powers of Bishop of Edessa and Apostle of the East, and the ordination of fourscore thousand bishops, priests, and deacons is derived from the same inexhaustible source. The speed of the zealous missionary was promoted by the fleetest dromedaries of a devout chief of the Arabs. The doctrine and discipline of the Jacobites were secretly established in the dominions of Justinian, and each Jacobite was compelled to violate the laws and to hate the Roman legislator. The successors of Severus, while they lurked in convents or villages, while they sheltered their proscribed heads in the caverns of hermits or the tents of the Saracens, still asserted, as they now assert, their indefeasible right to the title, the rank, and the prerogatives of Patriarch of Antioch. Under the milder yoke of the infidels, they reside about a league from Merdin, in the pleasant monastery of Zafaran, which they have embellished with cells, aqueducts, and plantations. The secondary, though honourable, place is filled by the Mafrian, who in his station at Mosul itself defies the Nestorian Catholic with whom he contests the primacy of the East. Under the Patriarch and the Mafrian, one hundred and fifty archbishops and bishops have been counted in the different ages of the Jacobite Church, but the order of the hierarchy is relaxed or dissolved, and the greater part of their dioceses is confined to the neighbourhood of the Euphrates and the Tigris. The cities of Aleppo and Amida, which are often visited by the Patriarch, contain some wealthy merchants and industrious mechanics, but the multitude derive their scanty sustenance from their daily labour, and poverty, as well as superstition, may impose their excessive fasts, five annual lents, during which both the clergy and laity abstain not only from flesh or eggs, but even from the taste of wine, of oil, and of fish. Their present numbers are esteemed from fifty to fourscore thousand souls. The remnant of a populous church, 
which was gradually decreased under the impression of twelve centuries. Yet in that long period some strangers of merit have been converted to the Monophysite faith, and a Jew was the father of a Bulpharagius, primate of the East, so truly eminent both in his life and death. In his life he was an elegant writer of the Syriac and Arabic tongues, a poet, physician and historian, a subtle philosopher and a moderate divine. In his death his funeral was attended by his rival, the Nestorian Patriarch, with a train of Greeks and Armenians who forgot their disputes and mingled their tears over the grave of an enemy. The sect which was honoured by the virtues of Abulpharagius appears, however, to sink below the level of their Nestorian brethren. The superstition of the Jacobites is more abject, their fasts more rigid, their intestine divisions are more numerous, and their doctors, as far as I can measure the degrees of nonsense, are more remote from the precincts of reason. Something may possibly be allowed for the rigour of the Monophysite theology, much more for the superior influence of the monastic order. In Syria, in Egypt, in Ethiopia, the Jacobite monks have ever been distinguished by the austerity of their penance and the absurdity of their legends. Alive or dead, they are worshipped as the favourites of the deity, the crozier of bishop and patriarch is reserved for their venerable hands, and they assume the government of men while they are yet reeking with the habits and prejudices of the cloister. 3. In the style of the Oriental Christians, the monothelites of every age are described under the appellation of Maronites, a name which has been insensibly transferred from a hermit to a monastery, from a monastery to a nation. Maron, a saint or savage of the fifth century, displayed his religious madness in Syria. The rival cities of Apamia and Emesa disputed his relics. A stately church was erected on his tomb, and six hundred of his disciples united their solitary cells on the banks of the Orontes. In the controversies of the Incarnation they nicely threaded the orthodox line between the sects of Nestorians and Eutyches, but the unfortunate question of one will or operation in the two natures of Christ was generated by their curious leisure. Their proselyte, the Emperor Heraclius, was rejected as a Maronite from the walls of Emesa. He found a refuge in the monastery of his brethren, and their theological lessons were repaid with the gift of a spacious and wealthy domain. The name and doctrine of this venerable school were propagated among the Greeks and Syrians, and their zeal is expressed by Macarius, patriarch of Antioch, who declared before the Synod of Constantinople that sooner than subscribe the two wills of Christ, he would submit to be hewn piecemeal and cast into the sea. A similar or less cruel mode of persecution soon converted the unresisting subjects of the plain, while the glorious title of Mardaites, or rebels, was bravely maintained by the hardy natives of Mount Libanus. John Maron, one of the most learned and popular of the monks, assumed the character of Patriarch of Antioch. His nephew Abraham, at the head of the Maronites, defended their civil and religious freedom against the tyrants of the East. The son of the Orthodox Constantine pursued with pious hatred a people of soldiers who might have stood the bulwark of his empire against the common foes of Christ and of Rome. An army of Greeks invaded Syria, the monastery of St. Maron was destroyed with fire, the bravest chieftains were betrayed and murdered, and twelve thousand of their followers were transplanted to the distant frontiers of Armenia and Thrace. Yet the humble nation of the Maronites had survived the empire of Constantinople, and they still enjoy under their Turkish masters a free religion and a mitigated servitude. Their domestic governors are chosen among the ancient nobility, the patriarch, in his monastery of Canobin, still fancies himself on the throne of Antioch. Nine bishops compose his synod, and one hundred and fifty priests, who retain the liberty of marriage, are entrusted with the care of one hundred thousand souls. Their country extends from the ridge of Mount Libanus to the shores of Tripoli, and the gradual descent affords in a narrow space each variety of soil and climate, from the holy cedars erect under the weight of snow, to the vine, the mulberry, and the olive trees of the fruitful valley. 
In the twelfth century, the Maronites, obduring the monothelite error, were reconciled to the Latin churches of Antioch and Rome, and the same alliance has been frequently renewed by the ambition of the popes and the distress of the Syrians. But it may reasonably be questioned whether their union has ever been perfect or sincere, and the learned Maronites of the College of Rome have vainly laboured to absolve their ancestors from the guilt of heresy and schism. 4. Since the age of Constantine, the Armenians had signalised their attachment to the religion and the empire of the Christians. The disorders of their country, and their ignorance of the Greek tongue, prevented their clergy from assisting at the Synod of Chalcedon, and they floated eighty-four years in a state of indifference or suspense, till their vacant faith was finally occupied by the missionaries of Julian of Halicarnassus, who in Egypt, their common exile, had been vanquished by the arguments or the influence of his rival Severus, the monophysite patriarch of Antioch. The Armenians alone are the pure disciples of Eutyches, an unfortunate parent who has been renounced by the greater part of his spiritual progeny. They alone persevere in the opinion that the manhood of Christ was created, or existed without creation, of a divine and incorruptible substance. Their adversaries reproach them with the adoration of a phantom, and they retort the accusation by deriding or execrating the blasphemy of the Jacobites, who impute to the Godhead the vile infirmities of the flesh, even the natural effects of nutrition and digestion. The religion of Armenia could not derive much glory from the learning or the power of its inhabitants. The royalty expired with the origin of their schism, and their Christian kings, who arose and fell in the thirteenth century on the confines of Cilicia, were the clients of the Latins and the vassals of the Turkish sultan of Iconium. The helpless nation has seldom been permitted to enjoy the tranquillity of servitude. From the earliest period to the present hour, Armenia has been the theatre of perpetual war. The lands between Tauris and Erivan were dispeopled by the cruel policy of the Sophies, and myriads of Christian families were transplanted to perish or to propagate in the distant provinces of Persia. Under the rod of oppression, the zeal of the Armenians is fervent and intrepid. They have often preferred the crown of martyrdom to the white turban of Mahomet, they devoutly hate the error and idolatry of the Greeks, and their transient union with the Latins is not less devoid of truth than the thousand bishops whom their patriarch offered at the feet of the Roman pontiff. The Catholic, or Patriarch, of the Armenians resides in the monastery of Ekniasin, three leagues from Erevan. Forty-seven archbishops, each of whom may claim the obedience of four or five suffragans, are consecrated by his hand, but the far greater part are only titular prelates, who dignify with their presence and service the simplicity of his court. As soon as they have performed the liturgy, they cultivate the garden, and our bishops will hear with surprise that the austerity of their life increases in just proportion to the elevation of their rank. In the fourscore thousand towns or villages of his spiritual empire, the patriarch receives a small and voluntary tax from each person above the age of fifteen, but the annual amount of six hundred thousand crowns is insufficient to supply the incessant demands of charity and tribute. Since the beginning of the last century, the Armenians have obtained a large and lucrative share of the commerce of the East. In their return from Europe, the caravan usually halts in the neighbourhood of Erivan, the altars are enriched with the fruits of their patient industry, and the faith of Eutyches is preached in their recent congregations of Barbary and Poland. 5. In the rest of the Roman Empire, the despotism of the prince might eradicate or silence the sectaries of an obnoxious creed, but the stubborn temper of the Egyptians maintained their opposition to the Synod of Chalcedon, and the policy of Justinian condescended to expect and to seize the opportunity of discord. The Monophysite Church of Alexandria was torn by the disputes of the Corruptibles and Incorruptibles, and on the death of the Patriarch the two factions upheld their respective candidates. Gaian was the disciple of Julian, Theodosius had been the pupil of Severus, the claims of the former were supported by the consent of the monks and senators, the city and the province. The latter depended on the priority of his ordination 
the favour of the Empress Theodora, and the arms of the eunuch Narses, which might have been used in more honourable warfare. The exile of the popular candidate to Carthage and Sardinia inflamed the ferment of Alexandria, and after a schism of one hundred and seventy years, the Gaianites still revered the memory and doctrine of their founder. The strength of numbers and of discipline was tried in a desperate and bloody conflict. The streets were filled with the dead bodies of citizens and soldiers. The pious women, ascending the roofs of their houses, showered down every sharp or ponderous utensil on the heads of their enemy, and the final victory of Narses was owing to the flames with which he wasted the third capital of the Roman world. But the lieutenant of Justinian had not conquered in the cause of a heretic. Theodosius himself was speedily, though gently, removed, and Paul of Tarnis, an orthodox monk, was raised to the throne of Athanasius. The powers of government were strained in his support. He might appoint or displace the dukes and tribunes of Egypt. The allowance of bread, which Diocletian had granted, was suppressed, the churches were shut, and a nation of schismatics was deprived at once of their spiritual and carnal food. In his turn the tyrant was excommunicated by the zeal and revenge of the people, and none except his servile Melkites would salute him as a man, a Christian, or a bishop. Yet such is the blindness of ambition, that when Paul was expelled on a charge of murder, he solicited with a bribe of seven hundred pounds of gold his restoration to the same station of hatred and ignominy. His successor, Apollinaris, entered the hostile city in military array, alike qualified for prayer or for battle. His troops, under arms, were distributed through the streets. The gates of the cathedral were guarded, and a chosen band was stationed in the choir to defend the person of their chief. He stood erect on his throne, and throwing aside the upper garment of a warrior, suddenly appeared before the eyes of the multitude in the robes of the Patriarch of Alexandria. Astonishment held them mute. But no sooner had Apollinaris begun to read the tome of St. Leo than a volley of curses and invectives and stones assaulted the odious minister of the Emperor and the Synod. A charge was instantly sounded by the successor of the apostles, the soldiers waded to their knees in blood, and two hundred thousand Christians are said to have fallen by the sword, an incredible account, even if it be extended from the slaughter of a day to the eighteen years of the reign of Apollinaris. Two succeeding patriarchs, Eulogius and John, laboured in the conversion of heretics, with arms and arguments more worthy of their evangelical profession. The theological knowledge of Eulogius was displayed in many a volume which magnified the errors of Eutyches and Severus, and attempted to reconcile the ambiguous language of St. Cyril with the orthodox creed of Pope Leo and the fathers of Chalcedon. The bounteous alms of John the Eleemosynary were dictated by superstition or benevolence or policy. Seven thousand five hundred poor were maintained at his expense. On his accession he found eight thousand pounds of gold in the treasury of the church, he collected ten thousand from the liberality of the faithful, yet the primate could boast in his testament that he left behind him no more than the third part of the smallest of the silver coins. The churches of Alexandria were delivered to the Catholics, the religion of the Monophysites was proscribed in Egypt, and a law was revived which excluded the natives from the honours and emoluments of the state. End of chapter 47, part 5Forty-seven, Part Six of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. A more important conquest still remained of the patriarch, the oracle, and leader of the Egyptian Church. Theodosius had resisted the threats and promises of Justinian with the spirit of an apostle or an enthusiast. Such, replied the patriarch, 
with the offers of the tempter when he showed the kingdoms of the earth. But my soul is far dearer to me than life or dominion. The churches are in the hands of a prince who can kill the body, but my conscience is my own, and in exile, poverty, or chains, I will steadfastly adhere to the faith of my holy predecessors, Athanasius, Cyril, and Dioscorus, anathema to the Tome of Leo and the Synod of Chalcedon, anathema to all who embrace their creed, anathema to them now and for evermore. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked shall I descend into the grave. Let those who love God follow me and seek their salvation. After comforting his brethren, he embarked for Constantinople, and sustained in six successive interviews the almost irresistible weight of the royal presence. His opinions were favourably entertained in the palace and the city. The influence of Theodora assured him a safe conduct and honourable dismission, and he ended his days, though not on the throne, yet in the bosom of his native country. On the news of his death, Apollinaris indecently feasted the nobles and the clergy, but his joy was checked by the intelligence of a new election, and while he enjoyed the wealth of Alexandria, his rivals reigned in the monasteries of Thebais, and were maintained by the voluntary oblations of the people. A perpetual succession of patriarchs arose from the ashes of Theodosius, and the Monophysite churches of Syria and Egypt were united by the name of Jacobites and the communion of the faith. But the same faith, which has been confined to a narrow sect of the Syrians, was diffused over the mass of the Egyptian or Coptic nation, who almost unanimously rejected the decrees of the Synod of Chalcedon. A thousand years were now elapsed since Egypt had ceased to be a kingdom, since the conquerors of Asia and Europe had trampled on the ready necks of a people whose ancient wisdom and power ascend beyond the records of history, the conflict of zeal and persecution rekindled some sparks of their national spirit. They abjured with a foreign heresy the manners and language of the Greeks. Every Melkite in their eyes was a stranger, every Jacobite a citizen. The alliance of marriage, the offices of humanity, were condemned as a deadly sin. The natives renounced all allegiance to the emperor, and his orders, at a distance from Alexandria, were obeyed only under the pressure of military force. A generous effort might have redeemed the religion and liberty of Egypt, and her six hundred monasteries might have poured forth their myriads of holy warriors, for whom death should have no terrors, since life had no comfort or delight. But experience has proved the distinction of active and passive courage. The fanatic who endures without a groan the torture of the rack or the stake would tremble and fly before the face of an armed enemy. The pusillanimous temper of the Egyptians could only hope for a change of masters. The arms of Khosroes depopulated the land, yet under his reign the Jacobites enjoyed a short and precarious respite. The victory of Heraclius renewed and aggravated the persecution, and the patriarch again escaped from Alexandria to the desert. In his flight, Benjamin was encouraged by a voice which bade him expect at the end of ten years the aid of a foreign nation marked like the Egyptians themselves with the ancient rite of circumcision. The character of these deliverers, and the nature of the deliverance, will be hereafter explained, and I shall step over the interval of eleven centuries to observe the present misery of the Jacobites of Egypt. The populous city of Cairo affords a residence or rather a shelter for their indigent patriarch and a remnant of ten bishops. Forty monasteries have survived the inroads of the Arabs, and the progress of servitude and apostasy has reduced the Coptic nation to the despicable number of twenty-five or thirty thousand families, a race of illiterate beggars, whose only consolation is derived from the superior wretchedness of the Greek patriarch and his diminutive congregation. 6. The Coptic patriarch, a rebel to the Caesars, or a slave to the caliphs, still gloried in the filial obedience of the kings of Nubia and Ethiopia. He repaid their homage by magnifying their greatness, and it was boldly asserted that they could bring into the field a hundred thousand horse, with an equal number of camels, that their hand could pour out or restrain the waters of the Nile, 
and the peace and plenty of Egypt was obtained even in this world by the intercession of the patriarch. In exile at Constantinople, Theodosius recommended to his patroness the conversion of the black nations of Nubia from the Tropic of Cancer to the confines of Abyssinia. Her design was suspected and emulated by the more orthodox emperor. The rival missionaries, a Melkite and a Jacobite, embarked at the same time, but the empress, from a motive of love or fear, was more effectually obeyed, and the Catholic priest was detained by the president of Thebais, while the king of Nubia and his court were hastily baptized in the faith of Dioscorus. The tardy envoy of Justinian was received and dismissed with honour, but when he accused the heresy and treason of the Egyptians, the negro convert was instructed to reply that he would never abandon his brethren, the true believers, to the persecuting ministers of the Synod of Chalcedon. During several ages the bishops of Nubia were named and consecrated by the Jacobite Patriarch of Alexandria. As late as the twelfth century Christianity prevailed, and some rites, some ruins, are still visible in the savage towns of Senar and Dongola. But the Nubians at length executed their threats of returning to the worship of idols. The climate required the indulgence of polygamy, and they have finally preferred the triumph of the Koran to the abasement of the cross. A metaphysical religion may appear too refined for the capacity of the negro race, yet a black or a parrot might be taught to repeat the words of the Chalcedonian or Monophysite creed. Christianity was more deeply rooted in the Abyssinian Empire, and though the correspondence has been sometimes interrupted above seventy or a hundred years, the mother church of Alexandria retains her colony in a state of perpetual pupillage. Seven bishops once composed the Ethiopic Synod. Had their number amounted to ten, they might have elected an independent primate, and one of their kings was ambitious of promoting his brother to the ecclesiastical throne, but the event was foreseen, the increase was denied. The episcopal office has been gradually confined to the abuna, the head and author of the Abyssinian priesthood. The patriarch supplies each vacancy with an Egyptian monk, and the character of a stranger appears more venerable in the eyes of the people, less dangerous in those of the monarch. In the sixth century, when the schism of Egypt was confirmed, the rival chiefs, with their patrons, Justinian and Theodora, strove to outstrip each other in the conquest of a remote and independent province. The industry of the empress was again victorious, and the pious Theodora has established in that sequestered church the faith and discipline of the Jacobites. Encompassed on all sides by the enemies of their religion, the Ethiopians slept near a thousand years, forgetful of the world by whom they were forgotten. They were awakened by the Portuguese, who, turning the southern promontory of Africa, appeared in India and the Red Sea as if they had descended through the air from a distant planet. In the first moments of their interview, the subjects of Rome and Alexandria observed the resemblance rather than the difference of their faith, and each nation expected the most important benefits from an alliance with their Christian brethren. In their lonely situation, the Ethiopians had almost relapsed into the savage life. Their vessels, which had traded to Ceylon, scarcely presumed to navigate the rivers of Africa. The ruins of Axume were deserted, the nation was scattered in villages, and the emperor, a pompous name, was content, both in peace and war, with the immovable residence of a camp. Conscious of their own indigence, the Abyssinians had formed the rational project of importing the arts and ingenuity of Europe, and their ambassadors at Rome and Lisbon were instructed to solicit a colony of smiths, carpenters, tilers, masons, printers, surgeons, and physicians for the use of their country. But the public danger soon called for the instant and effectual aid of arms and soldiers to defend an unwarlike people from the barbarians who ravaged the inland country and the Turks and Arabs who advanced from the sea-coast in more formidable array. Ethiopia was saved by 450 Portuguese, who displayed in the field the native valour of Europeans and the artificial power of the musket and cannon. In a moment of terror the emperor had promised to reconcile himself and his subjects to the Catholic faith, 
a Latin patriarch represented the supremacy of the Pope. The empire, enlarged in a tenfold proportion, was supposed to contain more gold than the mines of America, and the wildest hopes of avarice and zeal were built on the willing submission of the Christians of Africa. But the vows which pain had extorted were forsworn on the return of health. The Abyssinians still adhered with unshaken constancy to the Monophysite faith. Their languid belief was inflamed by the exercise of dispute. They branded the Latins with the names of Arians and Nestorians, and imputed the adoration of four gods to those who separated the two natures of Christ. Fremona, a place of worship, or rather of exile, was assigned to the Jesuit missionaries. Their skill in the liberal and mechanic arts, their theological learning, and the decency of their manners, inspired a barren esteem. But they were not endowed with the gift of miracles, and they vainly solicited a reinforcement of European troops. The patience and dexterity of forty years at length obtained a more favourable audience, and two emperors of Abyssinia were persuaded that Rome could ensure the temporal and everlasting happiness of her votaries. The first of these royal converts lost his crown and his life, and the rebel army was sanctified by the Abuna, who hurled an anathema at the apostate and absolved his subjects from their oath of fidelity. The fate of Zadengel was revenged by the courage and fortune of Susneus, who ascended the throne under the name of Segued, and more vigorously prosecuted the pious enterprise of his kinsmen. After the amusement of some unequal combats between the Jesuits and his illiterate priests, the emperor declared himself a proselyte to the Synod of Chalcedon, presuming that his clergy and people would embrace without delay the religion of their prince. The liberty of choice was succeeded by a law which imposed under pain of death the belief of the two natures of Christ. The Abyssinians were enjoined to work and to play on the Sabbath, and Segued, in the face of Europe and Africa, renounced his connection with the Alexandrian Church. A Jesuit, Alfonso Mendez, the Catholic Patriarch of Ethiopia, accepted in the name of Urban VIII the homage and abjuration of the penitent. "'I confess,' said the Emperor on his knees, I confess that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, the successor of St. Peter, and the sovereign of the world. To him I swear true obedience, and at his feet I offer my person and kingdom. A similar oath was repeated by his son, his brother, the clergy, the nobles, and even the ladies of the court. The Latin patriarch was invested with honours and wealth, and his missionaries erected their churches or citadels in the most convenient stations of the empire. The Jesuits themselves deplore the fatal indiscretion of their chief, who forgot the mildness of the gospel and the policy of his order, to introduce with hasty violence the liturgy of Rome and the inquisition of Portugal. He condemned the ancient practice of circumcision, which health rather than superstition had first invented in the climate of Ethiopia. A new baptism, a new ordination, was inflicted on the natives, and they trembled with horror when the most holy of the dead were torn from their graves, when the most illustrious of the living were excommunicated by a foreign priest. In the defence of their religion and liberty, the Abyssinians rose in arms, with desperate but unsuccessful zeal. Five rebellions were extinguished in the blood of the insurgents, two abunas were slain in battle, whole legions were slaughtered in the field, or suffocated in their caverns, and neither merit nor rank nor sex could save from an ignominious death the enemies of Rome. But the victorious monarch was finally subdued by the constancy of the nation, of his mother, of his son, and of his most faithful friends. Segued listened to the voice of pity, of reason, perhaps of fear, and his edict of liberty of conscience instantly revealed the tyranny and weakness of the Jesuits. On the death of his father, Basilides expelled the Latin patriarch, and restored to the wishes of the nation the faith and the discipline of Egypt. The Monophysite churches resounded with a song of triumph, that the sheep of Ethiopia were now delivered from the hyenas of the West, and the gates of that solitary realm were for ever shut against the arts, the science, and the fanaticism of Europe. 
End of chapter 47, part 6. Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 48 Succession and Characters of the Greek Emperors of Constantinople. From the time of Heraclius to the Latin conquest. I have now deduced from Trajan to Constantine, from Constantine to Heraclius, the regular series of the Roman emperors, and faithfully exposed the prosperous and adverse fortunes of their reigns. Five centuries of the decline and fall of the empire have already elapsed, but a period of more than eight hundred years still separates me from the term of my labours the taking of Constantinople by the Turks. Should I persevere in the same course, should I observe the same measure, a prolix and slender thread would be spun through many a volume, nor would the patient reader find an adequate reward of instruction or amusement. At every step as we sink deeper in the decline and fall of the Eastern Empire, the annals of each succeeding reign would impose a more ungrateful and melancholy task. These annals must continue to repeat a tedious and uniform tale of weakness and misery. The natural connection of causes and events would be broken by frequent and hasty transitions, and a minute accumulation of circumstances must destroy the light and effect of these general pictures, which compose the use and ornament of a remote history. From the time of Heraclius, the Byzantine theatre is contracted and darkened. The line of empire, which had been defined by the laws of Justinian, and the arms of Belisarius, recedes on all sides from our view. The Roman name, the proper subject of our inquiries, is reduced to a narrow corner of Europe, to the lonely suburbs of Constantinople, and the fate of the Greek Empire has been compared to that of the Rhine, which loses itself in the sands, before its waters can mingle with the ocean. The scale of dominion is diminished, to our view, by the distance of time and place. Nor is the loss of external splendour compensated by the nobler gifts of virtue and genius. In the last moments of her decay, Constantinople was doubtless more opulent and populous than Athens at her most flourishing era, when a scanty sum of six thousand talents, or twelve hundred thousand pounds sterling, was possessed by twenty-one thousand male citizens of an adult age. But each of these citizens was a free man, who dared to assert the liberty of his thoughts, words, and actions, whose person and property were guarded by equal law and who exercised his independent vote in the government of the Republic. Their numbers seem to be multiplied by the strong and various discriminations of character. Under the shield of freedom, on the wings of emulation of vanity, each Athenian aspired to the level of the national dignity. From this commanding eminence, some chosen spirit soared beyond the reach of a vulgar eye and the chances of superior merit in a great and populous kingdom, as they are proved by experience, would excuse the computation of imaginary millions. The territories of Athens, Sparta, and their allies, do not exceed a moderate province of France or England. But, after the trophies of Salamis and Plataea, they expand in our fancy to the gigantic size of Asia, which had been trampled under the feet of the victorious Greeks. But the subjects of the Byzantine Empire, who assume and dishonour the names both of Greeks and Romans, present a dead uniformity of abject vices, which are neither softened by the weakness of humanity, nor animated by the vigour of memorable crimes. The freemen of antiquity might repeat with generous enthusiasm the sentence of Homer, that on the first day of his servitude the captive is deprived of one half of his manly virtue. But the poet had only seen the effects of civil or domestic slavery, 
nor could he foretell that the second moiety of manhood must be annihilated by the spiritual despotism, which shackles not only the actions, but even the thoughts of the prostrate votary. By this double yoke, the Greeks were oppressed under the successors of Heraclius. The tyrant, a law of eternal justice, was degraded by the vices of his subjects, and on the throne, in the camp, in the schools, we search, perhaps with fruitless diligence, the names and characters that may deserve to be rescued from oblivion. Nor are the defects of the subject compensated by the skill and variety of the painters. Of a space of eight hundred years, the first four centuries are overspread with a cloud interrupted by some faint and broken rays of historical light. In the lives of the emperors, from Maurice to Alexius, Basil the Macedonian has alone been the theme of a separate work, and the absence or loss or imperfection of contemporary evidence must be poorly supplied by the doubtful authority of more recent compilers. The four last centuries are exempt from the reproach of punery, and with the Comnenian family, the historic muse of Constantinople again revives, but her apparel is gaudy, her motives are without elegance or grace. A succession of priests or courtiers treads in each other's footsteps in the same path of servitude and superstition. Their views are narrow, their judgment is feeble or corrupt, and we close the volume of copious barrenness, still ignorant of the causes of events, the characters of the actors, and the manners of the time which they celebrate or deplore. The observation which has been applied to a man may be extended to a whole people, that the energy of the sword is communicated to the pen, and it will be found by experience that the tone of history will rise or fall with the spirit of the age. From these considerations, I should have abandoned without regret the Greek slaves and their servile historians, had I not reflected that the fate of the Byzantine monarchy is passively connected with the most splendid and important revolutions which have changed the state of the world. The space of the lost provinces was immediately replenished with new colonies and rising kingdoms. The active virtues of peace and war deserted from the vanquished to the victorious nations. And it is in their origin and conquests, in their religion and government, that we must explore the causes and effects of the decline and fall of the Eastern Empire. Nor will this scope of narrative, the riches and variety of these materials, be incompatible with the unity of design and composition, as, in his daily prayers, the Mussulman of Fez or Delhi still turns his face towards the temper of Mecca, the historian's eyes shall be always fixed on the city of Constantinople. The excursive line may embrace the wilds of Arabia and Tartary, but the circle will be ultimately reduced to the decreasing limit of the Roman monarchy. On this principle I shall now establish the plan of the last two volumes of the present work. The first chapter will contain, in a regular series, the emperors who reigned at Constantinople during a period of six hundred years, from the days of Heraclius to the Latin conquest. A rapid abstract, which may be supported by a general appeal to the order and text of the original historians. In this introduction I shall confine myself to the revolutions of the throne, the succession of families, the personal characters of the Greek princes, the mode of their life and death, the maxims and influence of their domestic government, and the tendency of their reign to accelerate or suspend the downfall of the Eastern Empire. Such a chronological review will serve to illustrate the various argument of the subsequent chapters and each circumstance of the eventful story of the barbarians will adapt itself in a proper place to the Byzantine annals. The internal state of the empire, and the dangerous heresy of the poor Lassilians, which shook the east and enlightened the west, will be the subject of two separate chapters. But these inquiries must be postponed till our further progress shall have opened the view of the world in the ninth and tenth centuries of the Christian era. After this foundation of Byzantine history, 
the following nations will pass before our eyes, and each will occupy the space to which it may be entitled by greatness or merit, or the degree of connection with the Roman world and the present age. 1. The Franks a general appellation which includes all the barbarians of France, Italy, and Germany, who were united by the sword and sceptre of Charlemagne. The persecution of images and their votaries separated Rome and Italy from the Byzantine throne, and prepared the restoration of the Roman Empire in the West. 2. The Arabs or Saracens Three ample chapters will be devoted to this curious and interesting object. In the first after a picture of the country and its inhabitants, I shall investigate the character of Mohammed, the character, religion, and succession of the Prophet. In the second, I shall lead the Arabs to the conquest of Syria, Egypt, and Africa, the provinces of the Roman Empire. Nor can I check their victorious career till they have overthrown the monarchies of Persia and Spain. In the third, I shall inquire how Constantinople and Europe was saved by the luxury and arts, the division and decay, of the empire of the caliphs. A single chapter will include three the Bulgarians, four Hungarians, and five Russians, who, assaulted by sea or by land, the provinces and the capital. But the last of these, so important in their present greatness, will excite some curiosity in their origin and infancy. 6. The Normans, or rather the private adventurers of that warlike people, who founded a powerful kingdom in Apulia and Sicily, shook the throne of Constantinople, displayed the trophies of chivalry, and almost realized the wonders of romance. 7. The Latins, the subjects of the Pope, the nations of the West, who enlisted under the banners of the cross for the recovery or release of the Holy Sepulchre. The Greek emperors were terrified and preserved by the myriads of pilgrims who marched to Jerusalem with Godfrey of Bullion and the peers of Christendom. The second and third crusades trod in the footsteps of the first. Asia and Europe were mingled in a sacred war of two hundred years, and the Christian powers were bravely resisted, and finally expelled by Saladin and the Mamelukes of Egypt. In these memorable crusades, a fleet and army of French and Venetians were diverted from Syria to the Thracian Bosphorus. They assaulted the capital, they subverted the Greek monarchy, and a dynasty of Latin princes was seated near threescore years on the throne of Constantine. 8. The Greeks themselves, during this period of captivity and exile, must be considered as a foreign nation the enemies, and again the sovereigns of Constantinople. Misfortune had rekindled a spark of national virtue, and the imperial series may be continued with some dignity from their restoration to the Turkish conquest. 9. The Mughals and Tartars By the arms of Zingas and his descendants, the globe was shaken from China to Poland and Greece. The sultans were overthrown, the caliphs fell, and the Caesars trembled on their throne. The victories of Timur suspended above fifty years the final ruin of the Byzantine Empire. 10. I have already noticed the first appearance of the Turks, and the names of the fathers, of Seljuk and Othman, discriminated the two successive dynasties of the nation which emerged in the eleventh century from the Scythian wilderness. The former established a splendid and potent kingdom, from the banks of the Oxus to Antioch and Nice, and the first crusade was provoked by the violation of Jerusalem and the danger of Constantinople. From an humble origin, the Ottomans arose, the scourge and terror of Christendom. Constantinople was besieged and taken by Mohammed II and his triumph annihilates the remnant, the image, the title of the Roman Empire in the East. The schism of the Greeks will be connected with their last calamities, and the restoration of learning in the Western world. I shall return from the captivity of the new to the ruins of ancient Rome, 
and the venerable name, the interesting theme, will shed a ray of glory on the conclusion of my labours. The Emperor Heraclius had punished a tyrant and ascended his throne, and the memory of his reign is perpetrated by the transient conquest and irreparable loss of the eastern provinces. After the death of Eudocia, his first wife, he disobeyed the patriarch and violated the laws by his second marriage with his niece Martinia. And the superstition of the Greeks beheld the judgment of heaven in the diseases of the father and the deformity of his offspring. But the opinion of an illegitimate birth is sufficient to distract the choice and loosen the obedience of the people. The ambition of Martina was quickened by maternal love, and perhaps by the envy of a stepmother, and the aged husband was too feeble to withstand the arts of conjugal allurements. Constantine, his eldest son, enjoyed in a mature age the title of Augustus, but the weakness of his constitution required a colleague and a guardian, and he yielded with secret reluctance to the partition of the empire. The senate was summoned to the palace to ratify or attest the association of Heracleonus, the son of Martina. The imposition of the diadem was consecrated by the prayers and blessings of the patriarch. The senators and patricians adored the majesty of the great emperor, and the partners of his reign, and as soon as the doors were thrown open, they were held by the tumultuary but important voice of the soldiers. After an interval of five months, the pompous ceremonies which formed the essence of the Byzantine state were celebrated in the cathedral and the hippodrome. The concord of the royal brothers was effectively displayed by the younger leaning on the arm of the elder and the name of Martina was mingled in the reluctant or venial acclamations of the people. Heraclius survived this association about two years. His last testimony declared his two sons the equal heirs of the Eastern Empire, and commanded them to honour his widow Martina as their mother and their sovereign. When Martina first appeared on the throne with the name and attributes of royalty, she was checked by a firm, though respectful opposition and the dying embers of freedom were kindled by the breath of a superstitious prejudice. "'We reverence,' exclaimed the voice of a citizen, "'we reverence the mother of our princes. But to these princes alone our obedience is due, and Constantine, the elder emperor, is of an age to sustain in his own hands the weight of the sceptre. Your sex is excluded by nature from the toils of government. How could you combat?' How could you answer the barbarians who, with a hostile or friendly intentions, may approach the royal city? May heaven avert from the Roman Republic this national disgrace, which would provoke the patience of the slaves of Persia. Martina descended from the throne with indignation, and sought a refuge in the female apartment of the palace. The reign of Constantine III lasted only one hundred and three days. He expired in the thirtieth year of his age, and, although his life had been a long malady, a belief was entertained that poison had been the means, and his cruel stepmother the author of his untimely fate. Martina reaped indeed the harvest of his death, and assumed the government in the name of the surviving emperor. But the incestuous widow of Heraclius was universally abhorred. The jealousy of the people was awakened and the two orphans whom Constantine had left became the objects of the public care. It was in vain that the son of Martina, who was no more than fifteen years of age, was taught to declare himself the guardian of his nephews, one of whom he had presented at the baptism font. It was in vain that he swore on the wood of the true cross to defend them against all their enemies. On his deathbed, the late emperor had dispatched a trusty servant to arm the troops and provinces of the east, in the defence of his helpless children. The eloquence and liberality of Valentine had been successful, and from his camp of Chalcedon he boldly demanded the punishment of the assassins, and the restoration of the lawful heir. The licence of the soldiers, who devoured the grapes and drank the wine of their Asiatic vineyards, 
provoked the citizens of Constantinople against the domestic authors of their calamities. And the dome of St. Sophia re-echoed, not with prayers and hymns, but with the clamours and deprecations of the enraged multitude. At their imperious command, Heracleonis appeared in the pulpit with the eldest of the royal orphans. Constance alone was saluted as emperor of the Romans, and a crown of gold, which had been taken from the tomb of Heraclius, was placed on his head, with the solemn benediction of the patriarch. But, in the tumult of joy and indignation, the church was pillaged, the sanctuary was polluted by a promiscuous crowd of Jews and barbarians, and the monothelite Pyrrhus, a creature of the empress, after dropping a protestation on the altar, escaped by a prudent flight from the zeal of the Catholics. A more serious and bloody task was reserved for the Senate, who derived a temporary strength from the consent of the soldiers and the people. The spirit of Rome and freedom revived the ancient and awful examples of the judgment of tyrants, and the imperial culprits were deposed and condemned as the authors of the death of Constantine. But the severity of the conscript fathers was sustained by the indiscriminate punishment of the innocent and the guilty. Martina and Heracleonis were sentenced to the amputation, the former of her tongue, the latter of his nose. And, after this cruel execution, they consumed the remainder of their days in exile and oblivion. The Greeks, who were capable of reflection, might find some consolation for their servitude, by observing the abuse of power, when it was lodged for a moment in the hands of an aristocracy. We shall imagine ourselves transported five hundred years backwards to the age of the Antonines. If we listen to the oration which Constance the Second pronounced in the twelfth year of his age before the Byzantine Senate, after returning his thanks for the just punishment of the assassins, who had intercepted the fairest hopes of his father's reign, by the divine providence, said the young emperor, by your righteous decree, Martina and her incestuous progeny have been cast headlong from the throne. Your majesty and wisdom have prevented the Roman state from degenerating into lawless tyranny. I therefore exhort and beseech you to stand forth as the counsellors and judges of the common safety. The senators were gratified by this respectful address and liberal donative of their sovereign, but these servile Greeks were unworthy and regardless of freedom. And in his mind, the lesson of an hour was quickly erased by the prejudices of the age and the habits of despotism. He retained only a jealous fear lest the senate or people should one day invade the right of primogeniture and seat his brother Theodosius on an equal throne. By the imposition of holy orders, the grandson of Heraclius was disqualified from the purple. But this ceremony, which seemed to profane the sacraments of the church, was insufficient to appease the suspicions of the tyrant, and the death of the deacon Theodosius could alone expiate the crimes of his royal birth. His murder was avenged by the imprecations of the people, and the assassin, in the fullness of power, was driven from his capital into voluntary and perpetual exile. Constans embarked for Greece, and, as if he meant to retort the abhorrence which he deserved, he is said, from the imperial galley, to have spit against the walls of his native city. After passing the winter at Athens, he sailed to Teratium, in Italy, visited Rome, and concluded a long pilgrimage of disgrace and sacrilegious rapine, by fixing his residence at Syracuse. But if Constance could fly from his people, he could not fly from himself. The remorse of his conscience created a phantom who pursued him by land and sea, by day and night, and the visionary Theodosius, presenting to his lips a cup of blood, said, or seemed to say, Drink, brother, drink, a sure emblem of the aggravation of his guilt, since he had received from the hands of the deacon the mystic cup of the blood of Christ. Odious to himself and to mankind, Constance perished by domestic, perhaps by episcopal treason, in the capital of Sicily. 
A servant who waited in the bath, after pouring warm water on his head, struck him violently with the vase. He fell, stunned by the blow, and suffocated by the water, and his attendants, who wondered at the tedious delay, beheld with indifference the corpse of their lifeless emperor. The troops of Sicily, invested with the purple and obscure youth, whose inimitable beauty eluded, and it might easily elude, the declining art of the painters and sculptures of the age. Constans had left in the Byzantine palace three sons, the eldest of whom had been clothed in his infancy with the purple. When the father summoned them to attend his person in Sicily, these precious hostages were detained by the Greeks, and a firm refusal informed him that they were the children of the state. The news of his murder was conveyed with almost supernatural speed from Syracuse to Constantinople, and Constantine, the eldest of his sons, inherited his throne without being the heir of the public hatred. His subjects contributed, with zeal and alacrity, to chastise the guilt and presumption of a province which had usurped the rights of the senate and people. The young emperor sailed from the Hellespont with a powerful fleet, and the legions of Rome and Carthage were assembled under his standard in the harbour of Syracuse. The defeat of the Sicilian tyrant was easy, his punishment just, and his beauteous head was exposed in the hippodrome. But I cannot applaud the clemency of a prince, who, among a crowd of victims, condemned the son of a patrician for deploring with some bitterness the execution of a virtuous father. The youth was castrated. He survived the operation, and the memory of this indecent cruelty is preserved by the elevation of Germanus to the rank of patriarch and saint. After pouring this bloody liberation on his father's tomb, Constantine returned to his capital, and the growth of his young beard during the Sicilian voyage was announced by the familiar surname of Paganatus to the Grecian world. But his reign, like that of his predecessor, was stained with fraternal discord. On his two brothers, Heraclius and Tiberius, he had bestowed the title of Augustus, an empty title, for they continued to languish without trust or power in the solitude of the palace. At their secret instigation, the troops of the Antolian theme, or province, approached the city on the Asiatic side, demanded for the royal brothers the partition or excuse of sovereignty, and supported their seditious claims by a theological argument. They were Christians, they cried, and Orthodox Catholics, the sincere votaries of the holy and undivided Trinity, since there are three equal persons in heaven, it is reasonable there should be three equal persons upon earth. The emperor invited these learned divines to a friendly conference, in which they might propose their arguments to the senate. They obeyed the summons, but the prospects of their bodies hanging on the gibbet, in the suburb of Galata, reconciled their companions to the unity of the reign of Constantine. He pardoned his brothers, and their names were still pronounced in the public acclamations. But on the repetition or suspicion of a similar offence, the obnoxious princes were deprived of their titles and noses, in the presence of the Catholic bishops, who were assembled at Constantinople in the sixth general synod. In the close of his life, Paganatus was anxious only to establish the right of primogenitor. The heir of his two sons, Justinian and Heraclius, was offered on the shrine of St. Peter, as a symbol of their spiritual adoption by the Pope. But the elder alone was exalted to the rank of Augustus, and the assurance of the empire. Roman world devolved to Justinian the Second, and the name of a triumphant lawgiver was dishonoured by the vices of a boy, who imitated his namesake only in the expensive luxury of building. His passions were strong, his understanding was feeble, and he was intoxicated with a foolish pride that his birth had given him the command of millions, of whom the smallest community would not have chosen him for their local magistrate. His favourite ministers were two beings the least susceptible of human sympathy, a eunuch and a monk. To the one he abandoned the palace, 
to the other the finances. The former corrected the emperor's mother with a scourge. The latter suspended the insolvent tributaries, with their heads downwards, over a small and smoky fire. Since the days of Commodus and Caracalla, the cruelty of the Roman princes had most commonly been the effect of their fear. But Justinian, who possessed some vigour of character, enjoyed the sufferings and braved the revenge of his subjects about ten years, till the measure was full of his crimes and of their patience. In a dark dungeon, Leontius, a general of reputation, had groaned above three years, with some of the noblest and most deserving of the patricians. He was suddenly drawn forth to assume the government of Greece, and this promotion of an injured man was a mark of the contempt rather than of the confidence of his prince. As he was followed to the port by the kind offices of his friends, Leontius observed with a sigh that he was a victim adorned for sacrifice, and that inevitable death would pursue his footsteps. They ventured to reply that glory and empire might be the recompense of a generous resolution, that every order of man abhorred the reign of a monster, and that the hands of two hundred thousand patriots expected only the voice of a leader. The night was chosen for their deliverance, and in the first effort of the conspirators the prefect was slain, and the prisons were forced open. The emissaries of Leontius proclaimed in every street Christians to St. Sophia, and the seasonable text of the patriarch this is to defy the Lord, was the prelude of an inflammatory sermon. From the church the people adjourned to the Hippodrome. Justinian, in whose cause not a sword had been drawn, was dragged before these tumultuary judges, and their clamours demanded the instant death of a tyrant. But Leontius, who was already clothed with the purple, cast an eye of pity on the prostrate son of his own benefactor, and of so many emperors. The life of Justinian was spared. The amputation of his nose, perhaps of his tongue, was imperfectly performed. The happy flexibility of the Greek language could impose the name of Rhino Timetus, and the mutated tyrant was banished to Chirosne in Crim Tartary, a lonely settlement where corn, wine, and oil were imported as foreign luxuries. On the edge of the Scythian wilderness, Justinian still cherished the pride of his birth, and the hope of his restoration. After three years' exile he received the pleasing intelligence that his injury was avenged by a second revolution, and that Leontius, in his turn, had been dethroned and mutilated by the rebel Apsimar, who assumed the more respectable name of Tiberius but the claim of lineal succession was still formidable to a plebeian usurper, and his jealousy was stimulated by the complaints and charges of the Chrysanites, who beheld the vices of the tyrant in the spirit of the exile. With a band of followers, attached to his person by a common hope or common despair, Justinian fled from the inhospitable shore to the horde of the Shazars, who pitched their tents between the Tanais and Borysthianus. The Khan entertained with pity and respect the royal suppliant. Phanagoria, once an opulent city, on the Asiatic side of the Lake Moetus, was assigned for his residence, and every Roman prejudice was stifled in his marriage with the sister of the barbarian, who seems, however, from the name of Theodora, to have received the sacrament of baptism. But the faithless Shazar was soon tempted by the gold of Constantinople, and had not the design been revealed by the conjugal love of Theodora, her husband must have been assassinated or betrayed into the power of his enemies. After strangling, with his own hands, the two emissaries of the Khan, Justinian sent back his wife to her brother, and embarked on the Euxine in search of new and more faithful allies. His vessel was assaulted by a violent tempest, and one of his pious companions advised him to deserve the mercy of God by a vow of general forgiveness, if he should be restored to the throne. 
"'Of forgiveness?' replied the intrepid tyrant. "'May I perish this instant! "'May I perish this instant! "'May the Almighty whelm me in the waves "'if I consent to spare a single head of my enemies!' "'He survived this impious menace, "'sailed into the mouth of the Danube, "'trusted his person in the royal village of the Bulgarians, "'and purchased the aid of Tobelus, "'a pagan conqueror, "'by the promise of his daughter, "'and of a fair partition of the treasures of the empire. "'The Bulgarian kingdom extended to the confines of Thrace, "'and the two princes besieged Constantinople "'at the head of fifteen thousand horse. "'Epsimar was dismayed, by the sudden and hostile apparition of his rival, whose head had been promised by the Shazar, and of whose evasion he was yet ignorant. After an absence of ten years, the crimes of Justinian were faintly remembered, and the birth and misfortunes of this hereditary sovereign excited the pity of the multitude, ever discontent with the ruling powers, and by the active diligence of his adherents, he was introduced into the city and palace of Constantine. End of chapter 48, part 1「2. Of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 48. Succession and Characters of the Greek Emperors. Part two. In rewarding his allies and recalling his wife, Justinian displayed some sense of honour and gratitude, and Tibellus retired, after sweeping away a heap of gold coin, which he measured with his Scythian whip. But never was a vow more religiously performed than the sacred oath of revenge which he had sworn amidst the storms of the Euxin. The two usurpers, for I must reserve the name of tyrant for the conqueror, were dragged into the hippodrome, the one from his prison, the other from his palace. Before their execution, Leontius and Apsimar were cast prostrate in chains beneath the throne of the emperor, and Justinian, planting a foot in each of their necks, contemplated above an hour the chariot race, while the inconstant people shouted, in the words of the psalmist, Thou shalt trample on the asp and basilisk, and on the lion and dragon shalt thou set thy foot. The universal defection which he had once experienced might provoke him to repeat the wish of Caligula that the Roman people had but one head. Yet I shall presume to observe that such a wish is unworthy of an ingenious tyrant, since his revenge and cruelty would have been extinguished by a single blow, instead of the slow variety of tortures which Justinian inflicted on the victims of his anger. His pleasures were inexhaustible, neither private virtue nor public service could expiate the guilt of active or even passive obedience to an established government. And, during the six years of his new reign, he considered the axe, the cord, and the rack as the only instruments of royalty. But his most implacable hatred was pointed against the Chrysanites, who had insulted his exile and violated the laws of hospitality. Their remote situation afforded some means of defence, or at least of escape, and a grievous tax was imposed on Constantinople to supply the preparations of a fleet and army. All are guilty and all must perish, was the mandate of Justinian, and the bloody execution was entrusted to his favourite Stephen, who was recommended by the epithet of the savage. Yet even the savage Stephen imperfectly accomplished the intentions of his sovereign. The slowness of his attack allowed the greater part of the inhabitants to withdraw into the country, and the minister of vengeance contented himself with reducing the youth of both sexes to a state of servitude, while roasting alive seven of the principal citizens, with drowning twenty in the sea, and reserving forty-two in chains to receive their doom from the mouth of the emperor. In their return, 
the fleet was driven on the rocky shores of Anatolia, and Justinian applauded the obedience of the Uxin, which had involved so many thousands of his subjects and enemies in a common shipwreck. But the tyrant was still insatiate of blood, and a second expedition was commanded to extirpate the remains of the prescribed colony. In the short interval, the Chersonites had returned to their city, and were prepared to die in arms. The Khan of the Shazars had renounced the cause of his odious brother. The exiles of every province were assembled in Tauris, and Bardanes, under the name of Philippicus, was invested with the purple. The imperial troops, unwilling and unable to perpetrate the revenge of Justinian, escaped his displeasure by abjuring his allegiance. The fleet, under their new sovereign, steered back a more auspicious course to the harbours of Sinope and Constantinople, and every tongue was prompt to pronounce, every hand to execute, the death of the tyrant. Destitute of friends, he was deserted by his barbarian guards, and the stroke of the assassin was praised as an act of patriotism and Roman virtue. His son Tiberius had taken refuge in a church. His aged grandmother guarded the door, and the innocent youth, suspending round his neck the most formidable relics, embraced with one hand the altar, with the other the wood of the true cross. But the popular fury that dares to trample on superstition is deaf to the cries of humanity, and the race of Heraclius was extinguished after a reign of one hundred years. Between the fall of the Heraclian and the rise of the Assyrian dynasty, a short interval of six years is divided into three reigns. Bardanes, or Philippicus, was hailed at Constantinople as a hero who had delivered his country from a tyrant, and he might taste some moments of happiness in the first transports of sincere and universal joy. Justinian had left behind him an ample treasure, the fruit of cruelty and rapine, but this useful fund was soon and idly dissipated by a successor. On the festival of his birthday, Philippicus entertained the multitude with the games of the Hippodrome. From thence he paraded through the streets with a thousand banners and a thousand trumpets, refreshed himself in the baths of Zipicus, and, returning to the palace, entertained his nobles with a sumptuous banquet. At the meridian hour he withdrew to his chamber, intoxicated with flattery and wine, and forgetful that his example had made every subject ambitious, and that every ambitious subject was his secret enemy. Some bold conspirators introduced themselves in the disorder of the feast, and the slumbering monarch was surprised, bound, blinded, and opposed, before he was sensible of his danger. Yet the traitors were deprived of their reward, and the free voice of the senate and people prompted Artemius from the office of security to that of emperor. He assumed the title of Anastasius the Second, and displayed, in a short and troubled reign, the virtues both of peace and war. But after the extinction of the imperial line, the rule of obedience was violated, and every change diffused the seeds of new revolutions. In a mutiny of the feet, an obscure and reluctant officer of the revenue was forcibly invested with the purple. After some months of a naval war, Anastasius resigned the sceptre, and the conqueror, Theodosius III, submitted in his turn to the supreme ascendance of Leo, the general and emperor of the oriental troops. His two predecessors were permitted to embrace the ecclesiastical profession. The restless impatience of Anastasius tempted him to risk and to lose his life in a treasonable enterprise. But the last days of Theodosius were honourable and secure. The single sublime word, health, which he inscribed on his tomb, expresses the confidence of philosophy or religion, and the fame of his miracles was long preserved among the people of Ephesus. Their convenient shelter of the church might sometimes impose a lesson of clemency, but it may be questioned whether it is for the public interest to diminish the perils of unsuccessful ambition. I have dwelt on the fall of a tyrant. I shall briefly represent the founder of a new dynasty, 
who is known to posterity by the invectives of his enemies, and whose public and private life is involved in the ecclesiastical story of the iconoclasts. Yet, in spite of the clamours of superstition, a favourable prejudice for the character of Leo the Isaurian may be reasonably drawn from the obscurity of his birth and the duration of his reign. 1. In an age of manly spirit, the prospect of an imperial reward would have kindled every energy of the mind, and produced a crowd of competitors as deserving as they were desirous to reign. Even in the corruption and debility of the modern Greeks, the elevation of a plebeian from the last to the first rank of society supposes some qualifications above the level of the multitude. He would probably be ignorant and disdainful of speculative science, and, in the pursuit of fortune, he might absolve himself from the obligations of benevolence and justice. But to his character we may ascribe the useful virtues of prudence and fortitude, the knowledge of mankind, and the important art of gaining their confidence and directing their passions. It is agreed that Leo was a native of Isauria, and that Conon was his primitive name. The writers, whose awkward satire is praise, describe him as an itinerant peddler, who drove an ass with some paltry merchandise to the country fairs, and foolishly relate that he met on the road some Jewish fortune-tellers, who promised him the Roman Empire, on condition that he should abolish the worship of idols. A more probable account relates the migration of his father from Asia Minor to Thrace, where he exercised the lucrative trade of a grazier, and he must have acquired considerable wealth, since the first introduction of his son was procured by a supply of five hundred sheep to the imperial camp. His first service was in the guard of Justinian, where he soon attracted the notice, and by degrees the jealousy of the tyrant. His valour and dexterity were conspicuous in the Colchian war. From Anastasius he received the command of the Anatolian legions, and by the suffrage of the soldiers he was raised to the empire with the general applause of the Roman world. 2. In this dangerous elevation, Leo III supported himself against the envy of his equals. The discontent of a powerful faction, and the assaults of his foreign and domestic enemies. The Catholics, who accuse his religious innovations, are obliged to confess that they were undertaken with temper and conducted with firmness. Their silence respects the wisdom of his administration and the purity of his manners. After a reign of twenty four years, he peaceably expired in the palace of Constantinople, and the purple which he had acquired was transmitted by the right of inheritance to the third generation. In a long reign of thirty-four years, the son and successor of Leo, Constantine V, surnamed Coprinimus, attacked with less temperate zeal the images or idols of the church. Their votaries have exhausted the bitterness of religious gall, in their portrait of this spotted panther, this antichrist, this flying dragon of the serpent seed, who surpassed the vices of Agabalus and Nero. His reign was a long butchery of whatever was most noble, or holy, or innocent in his empire. In person, the emperor assisted at the execution of his victims, surveyed their agonies, listened to their groans, and indulged, without satiating, his appetite for blood. A plate of noses was accepted as a grateful offering, and his domestics were often scourged or mutilated by the royal hand. His surname was derived from his pollution of his baptismal font. The infant might be excused, but the manly pleasures of Corpronimus degraded him below the level of a brute. His lust confounded the eternal distinctions of sex and species, and he seemed to extract some unnatural delight from the objects most offensive to human sense. In his religion the iconoclast was a heretic, a Jew, a Mohammedan, a pagan, and an atheist and his belief of an invisible power could be discovered only in his magic rites, human victims, and nocturnal sacrifices to Venus, and the demons of antiquity. His life was stained with the most opposite vices, and the ulcers which covered his body, anticipated before his death the sentiment of hell-tortures. 
Of these accusations, which I have so patiently copied, a part is refuted by its own absurdity, and in the private anecdotes of the life of the princes, the lie is more easy as the detection is more difficult. Without adopting the pernicious maxim, that where much is alleged, something must be true, I can, however, discern that Constantine V was dissolute and cruel. Calmony is more prone to exaggerate than to invent, and her licentious tongue is checked in some measure by the experience of the age and country to which she appeals. Of the bishops and monks, the generals and magistrates, who are said to have suffered under his reign, the numbers are recorded, the names were conspicuous, the execution was public, the mutilation visible and permanent. The Catholics hated the person and government of Copronymus, but even their hatred is a proof of their oppression. They dissembled the provocations which might excuse or justify his rigour, but even these provocations must gradually inflame his resentment and harden his temper in the use or the abuse of despotism. Yet the character of the fifth Constantine was not devoid of merit, nor did his government always deserve the curses or the contempt of the Greeks. From the confession of his enemies, I am informed of the restoration of an ancient aqueduct, of the redemption of two thousand five hundred captives, of the uncommon plenty of the times, and of the new colonies with which he repeopled Constantinople and the Thracian cities. They reluctantly praise his activity and courage. He was on horseback in the field at the head of his legions, and, although the fortune of his arms was various, he triumphed by sea and land, on the Euphrates and the Danube, in civil and barbarian war. Heretical praise must be cast into the scale to counterbalance the weight of orthodox invective. The iconoclasts revered the virtues of the prince. Forty years after his death they still prayed before the tomb of the saint. A miraculous vision was propagated by fanaticism or fraud, and the Christian hero appeared on a milk-white steed, brandishing his lance against the pagans of Bulgaria. An absurd fable, says the Catholic historian, since Copronymus is chained with the demons in the abyss of hell. Leo the Fourth, the son of the Fifth and the father of the Sixth Constantine, was of a feeble constitution both of mind and body, and the principal care of his reign was the settlement of his succession. The association of the young Constantine was urged by the officious zeal of his subjects, and the emperor, conscious of his decay, complied after a prudent hesitation with their unanimous wishes. The royal infant, at the age of five years, was crowned with his mother Irene, and the national consent was ratified by every circumstance of pomp and solemnity that could dazzle the eyes or bind the conscience of the Greeks. An oath of fidelity was administrated in the palace, the church, and the hippodrome, to the several orders of the state, who adjured the holy names of the Son and the Mother of God. Be witness, O Christ, that we will watch over the safety of Constantine, the son of Leo, expose our lives in his service, and bear true allegiance to his person and posterity. They pledged their faith on the wood of the true cross, and the act of their engagement was deposited on the altar of St. Sophia. The first to swear, and the first to violate their oath, were the five sons of Copronymus by a second marriage. And the story of these princes is singular and tragic. The right of primogeniture excluded them from the throne. The injustice of their elder brother defrauded them on a legacy of about two million sterling. Some vain titles were not deemed a sufficient compensation for wealth and power, and they repeatedly conspired against their nephew, before and after the death of his father. Their first attempt was pardoned. For the second offence, they were condemned to the ecclesiastical state, and for the third treason, Nick Forius, the eldest and most guilty, was deprived of his eyes, and his four brothers, Christopher, Nictas, Anthemius, and Eudoxus, were punished, as the milder sentence, by the amputation of their tongues. 
After five years' confinement they escaped to the church of St. Sophia, and displayed a pathetic spectacle to the people. "'Countrymen and Christians,' cried Nicphorus, for himself and his mute brethren, "'behold the sons of your emperor, if you can still recognize our features in this miserable state. A life, an imperfect life, is all that the malice of our enemies has spared. It is now threatened, and we now throw ourselves on your compassion.' The rising murmur might have produced a revolution, had it not been checked by the presence of a minister, who soothed the unhappy princes with flattery and hope, and gently drew them from the sanctuary to the palace. They were speedily embarked for Greece, and Athens was allotted for the place of their exile. In this calm retreat, and in their helpless condition, Nick Forus and his brothers were tormented by the thirst of power, and tempted by a Sclavonian chief, who offered to break their prison, and to lead them in arms, and in the purple, to the gates of Constantinople. But the Athenian people, ever zealous in the cause of Irene, prevented her justice or cruelty, and the five sons of Copronymus were plunged in eternal darkness and oblivion. For himself that emperor had chosen a barbarian wife, the daughter of the Khan of the Shazars, but in the marriage of his heir he preferred an Athenian virgin, an orphan seventeen years old, whose sole fortune must have consisted in her personal accomplishments. The nuptials of Leo and Irene were celebrated with royal pomp. She soon acquired the love and confidence of a feeble husband, and in his testament he declared the empress guardian of the Roman world, and of their son Constantine the Sixth, who was no more than ten years of age. During his childhood, Irene most ably and assiduously discharged, in her public administration, the duties of a faithful mother, and her zeal in the restoration of images, has deserved the name and honours of a saint, which she still occupies in the Greek calendar. But the emperor attained the maturity of youth, the maternal yoke became more grievous, and he listened to the favourites of his own age, who shared his pleasures, and were ambitious of sharing his power. Their reasons convinced him of his right, their praises of his ability to reign. And he consented to reward the services of Irene by a perpetual banishment to the Isles of Sicily. But her vigilance and penetration easily disconcerted their rash projects. A similar, or more severe, punishment was retaliated on themselves and their advisers and Irene inflicted on the ungrateful prince the chastisement of a boy. After this contest, the mother and the son were at the head of two domestic factions, and instead of mild influence and voluntary obedience, she held in chains a captive and an enemy. The empress was overthrown by the abuse of victory. The oath of fidelity, which she extracted to herself alone, was pronounced with reluctant murmurs and the bold refusal of the Armenian guards encouraged a free and general declaration that Constantine the Sixth was the lawful emperor of the Romans. In this character he ascended his hereditary throne, and dismissed Irene to a life of solitude and repose. But her haughty spirit condescended to the arts of dissimulation. She flattered the bishops and eunuchs, revived the filial tenderness of the prince, regained his confidence, and betrayed his credulity. The character of Constantine was not destitute of sense or spirit, but his education had been studiously neglected, and the ambitious mother exposed to the public censure the vices which she had nourished, and the actions which she had secretly advised. His divorce and second marriage offended the prejudices of the clergy, and by his imprudent rigour he fortified the attachment of the Armenian guards. A powerful conspiracy was formed for the restoration of Irene, and the secret, though widely diffused, was faithfully kept above eight months, till the emperor, suspicious of his danger, escaped from Constantinople with the design of appealing to the provinces and armies. By this hasty flight the empress was left on the brink of the precipice, yet before she implored the mercy of her son, 
Irene addressed a private epistle to the friends whom she had placed about her person, with a menace that, unless they accomplished, she would reveal their treason. Their fear rendered them intrepid. They seized the emperor on the Asiatic shore, and he was transported to the porphyry apartment of the palace, where he had first seen the light. In the mind of Irene, ambition had stifled every sentiment of humanity and nature, and it was decreed in her bloody council that Constantine should be rendered incapable of the throne. Her emissaries assaulted the sleeping prince, and stabbed their daggers with such violence and precipitation into his eyes, as if they meant to execute a mortal sentence. An ambiguous passage of Theophanes persuaded the analyst of the church that death was the immediate consequence of this barbarous execution. The Catholics had been deceived or subdued by the authority of Baronius, and Protestant zeal has re-echoed the words of a cardinal, desirous, it should seem, to favour the patroness of images. Yet the blind son of Irene survived many years, oppressed by the court and forgotten by the world. The Isaurian dynasty was silently extinguished, and the memory of Constantine was recalled only by the nuptials of his daughter, Euphrosyne, with the Emperor Michael II. The most bigoted orthodoxy has just execrated the unnatural mother, who may not easily be paralleled in the history of crimes. To her bloody deed superstition has attributed a subsequent darkness of seventeen days, during which many vessels in midday were driven from their course, as if the sun, a globe of fire so vast and so remote, could sympathise with the atoms of a revolving planet. On earth, the crime of Irene was left five years unpunished. Her reign was crowned with external splendour, and if she could silence the voice of conscience, she neither heard nor regarded the reproaches of mankind. The Roman world bowed to the government of a female, and as she moved through the streets of Constantinople, the reins of four milk-white steeds were held by as many patricians, who marched on foot before the golden chariot of their queen. But these patricians were for the most part eunuchs, and their black ingratitude justified, on this occasion, the popular hatred and contempt. Raised, enriched, entrusted, with the first dignities of the empire, they basely conspired against their benefactress. The great treasurer Nicephorus was secretly invested with the purple. Her successor was introduced into the palace, and crowned at St. Sophia by the venial patriarch. In their first interview, she recapitulated with dignity the revolutions of her life, gently accused the perfidy of Nicephorus, insinuated that he owed his life to her unsuspicious clemency, and for the thrones and treasures which she had resigned, solicited a decent and honourable retreat. His avarice refused this modest compensation, and in her exile of the Isle of Lesbos, the empress earned a scanty subsistence by the labours of her distaff. Many tyrants have reigned undoubtedly more criminal than Nicephorus, but none perhaps have more deeply incurred the universal abhorrence of their people. His character was stained with three odious vices of hypocrisy, ingratitude, and avarice. His want of virtue was not redeemed by any superior talents, nor his want of talents by any pleasing qualifications. Unskilful and unfortunate in war, Nicephorus was vanquished by the Saracens and slain by the Bulgarians, and the advantage of his death overbalanced, in the public opinion, the destruction of a Roman army. His son and heir, Staracius, escaped from the field with a mortal wound, yet six months of an expiring life were sufficient to refute his indecent, though popular deceleration that he would in all things avoid the example of his father. On the near prospect of his decease, Michael, the great master of the palace, and husband of his sister, Procopia, was named by every person of the palace and city, except by his envious brother. Tenacious of a sceptre now falling from his hand, he conspired against the life of his successor and cherished the idea of changing to a democracy the Roman Empire. 
but these rash projects served only to inflame the zeal of the people, and to remove the scruples of the candidate. Michael I accepted the purple, and before he sunk into the grave, the son of Nicophorus implored the clemency of his new sovereign. Had Michael, in an age of peace, ascended an hereditary throne, he might have reigned and died the father of his people. But his mild virtues were adapted to the shade of private life, nor was he capable of controlling the ambition of his equals, or of resisting the armies of the victorious Bulgarians. While his want of ability and success exposed him to the contempt of the soldiers, the masculine spirit of his wife Procopia awakened their indignation. Even the Greeks of the ninth century were provoked by the insolence of a female, who, in the front of the standards, presumed to direct their discipline and animate their valour. And their licentious clamours advised the new Semiramis to reverence the majesty of a Roman camp. After an unsuccessful campaign, in their winter quarters of Thrace, a disaffected army under the command of his enemies, and their artful eloquence persuaded the soldiers to break the dominion of the eunuchs, to degrade the husband of Procopia, and to assert the right of a military election. They marched towards the capital. Yet the clergy, the senate, and the people of Constantinople adhered to the cause of Michael. And the troops and treasures of Asia might have protracted the mischiefs of civil war. But his humanity, by the ambitious it will be termed his weakness, protested that not a drop of Christian blood should be shed in his quarrel, and his messengers presented the conquerors with the keys of the city and the palace. They were disarmed by his innocence and submission. His life and his eyes were spared, and the imperial monk enjoyed the comforts of solitude and religion above thirty-two years after he had been stripped of the purple and separated from his wife. The famous and unfortunate Bardanes had once the curiosity to consult an Asiatic prophet, who, after prognosticating his fall, announced the fortunes of his three principal officers, Leo the Armenian, Michael the Phrygian, and Thomas the Cappadocian. The successive reigns of the two former, the fruitless and fatal enterprise of the third. This prediction was verified, or rather was produced, by the event. Ten years afterwards, when the Thracian camp rejected the husband of Procopia, the crown was presented to the same Leo, the first in military rank and the second author of the mutiny. As he affected to hesitate, with this sword, says his companion Michael, I will open the gates of Constantinople to your imperial sway, or instantly plunge it into your bosom if you obstinately resist the just desires of your fellow soldiers. The compliance of the Armenian was rewarded with the empire, and he reigned seven and a half years under the name of Leo V. Educated in a camp, and ignorant both of laws and letters, he introduced into his civil government the rigour and even cruelty of military discipline. But if his severity was sometimes dangerous to the innocent, it was always formidable to the guilty. His religious inconstancy was taxed by the epithet of chameleon, but the Catholics have acknowledged, by the voice of a saint and confessors, that the life of the iconoclast was useful to the Republic. The zeal of his companion Michael was repaid with riches, honours, and military command, and his subordinate talents were beneficially employed in the public service. Yet the Phrygian was dissatisfied at receiving as a favour a scanty portion of the imperial prize which he had bestowed on his equal and his discontent, which sometimes evaporated in hasty discourse, at length assumed a more threatening and hostile aspect against a prince whom he respected as a cruel tyrant. That tyrant, however, repeatedly detected, warned, and dismissed the old companion of his arms, till fear and resentment prevailed over gratitude, and Michael, after a scrutiny into his actions and designs, was convicted of treason, and sentenced to be burnt alive in the furnace of the private baths. The devout humanity of the Empress Theophano was fatal to her husband and family. A solemn day, the 25th of December, 
had been fixed for the execution. She urged that the anniversary of the Saviour's birth would be profound by this inhuman spectacle, and Leo consented with reluctance to his decent respite. But on the vigil of the feast his sleepless anxiety prompted him to visit at the dead of night the chamber in which his enemy was confined. He beheld him released from his chain, and stretched on his jailer's bed in a profound slumber. Leo was alarmed at these signs of security and intelligence. But though he retired with silent steps, his entrance and departure were noticed by a slave who lay concealed in a corner of the prison. Under the pretense of requesting the spiritual aid of a confessor, Michael informed the conspirators that their lives depended on his discretion, and that a few hours were left to assure their own safety by the deliverance of their friend and country. On the great festival, a chosen band of priests and chanters was admitted into the palace by a private gate to sing matins in the chapel, and Leo, who regulated with the same strictness the discipline of the choir and of the camp, was seldom absent from these early devotions. In the ecclesiastical habit, but with their swords under their robes, the conspirators mingled with the procession, lurked in the angles of the chapel, and expected, as the sign of murder, the intonation of the first psalm by the emperor himself. The imperfect light and the uniformity of dress might have favoured his escape, whilst their assault was pointed against a harmless priest, but they soon discovered their mistake, and encompassed on all sides the royal victim. Without a weapon and without a friend, he grasped a weighty cross, and stood at bay against the hunters of his life. But as he asked for mercy, this is the hour, not of mercy, but of vengeance, was the inexorable reply. The stroke of a well-aimed sword separated from his body the right arm and the cross, and Leo the Armenian was slain at the foot of the altar. A memorial reverse of fortune was displayed in Michael the Second, who, from a defect in his speech, was surnamed the Stammerer. He was snatched from the fiery furnace to the sovereignty of an empire, and, as in the tumult a smith could not readily be found, the fetters remained on his legs, several hours after he was seated on the throne of the Caesars. The royal blood which had been the price of his elevation was unprofitably spent. In the purple he retained the ignoble vices of his origin, and Michael lost his provinces with a supine indifference as if they had been the inheritance of his fathers. His title was disputed by Thomas, the last of the military triumvirate, who transported into Europe fourscore thousand barbarians from the banks of the Tigris and the shores of the Caspian. He formed the siege of Constantinople, but the capital was defended with spiritual and carnal weapons. A Bulgarian king assaulted the camp of the Orientals, and Thomas had the misfortune, or the weakness, to fall alive into the power of the conqueror. The hands and feet of the rebel were amputated, he was placed on an ass, and, amidst the insults of the people, was led through the streets, which he sprinkled with his blood. The deprivation of manners, as savage as they were corrupt, is marked by the presence of the emperor himself. Deaf to the lamentation of a fellow soldier, he incessantly pressed the discovery of more accomplices till his curiosity was checked by the question of an honest or guilty minister. Would you give credit to an enemy against the most faithful of your friends? After the death of his first wife, the emperor, at the request of the senate, drew from her monastery Euphrosyne, the daughter of Constantine the Sixth. Her august birth might justify a stipulation in the marriage contract, that her children should equally share the empire with their elder brother but the nuptials of Michael and Euphrosyne were barren, and she was content with the title of mother of Theophilus, his son and successor. The character of Theophilus is a rare example in which religious zeal has allowed, and perhaps magnified, the virtues of a heretic and a persecutor. His valour was often felt by the enemies, and his justice by the subjects of the monarchy. But the valour of Theophilus was rash and fruitless, and his justice arbitrary and cruel. 
he displayed the banners of the cross against the Saracens, but his five expeditions were concluded by a signal overthrow. Amorium, the native city of his ancestors, was levelled with the ground, and from his military toils he derived only the surname of the unfortunate. The wisdom of a sovereign is comprised in his institution of laws and the choice of his magistrates, and while he seems without action, his civil government revolves around his centre with the silence and order of the planetary system. But the justice of Theophilus was fashioned on the model of the oriental despots, who, in personal and irregular acts of authority, consult the reason or passions of the moment, without measuring the sentence by the law or the penalty by the offence. A poor woman threw herself at the emperor's feet to complain of a powerful neighbour, the brother of the empress, who had raised his palace wall to such an inconvenient height that her humble dwelling was excluded from light and air. On the proof of the fact, instead of granting, like an ordinary judge, sufficient or ample damages to the plaintiff, the sovereign adjudged to her use and benefit the palace and the ground. Nor was Theophilus content with this extravagant satisfaction. His zeal converted a civil trespass into a criminal act, and the unfortunate patrician was stripped and scourged in the public place of Constantinople. For some venial offences, some defect of equity or vigilance, the principal ministers, a prefect, a quaestor, a captain of the guards, were banished or mutilated, or scalded with boiling pitch, or burnt alive in the hippodrome. And as these dreadful examples might be the effects of error or caprice, they must have alienated from his service the best and wisest of the citizens. But the pride of the monarch was flattered in the exercise of power, or, as he thought, of virtue, and the people, safe in their obscurity, applauded the danger and debasement of their superiors. This extraordinary rigour was justified, in some measure, by its salutary consequences, since, after a scrutiny of seventeen days, not a complaint or abuse could be found in the court or city, and it might be alleged that the Greeks could be ruled only with a rod of iron, and that the public interest is the motive and law of the supreme judge. Yet in the crime, or the suspicion of treason, that judge is of all others the most credulous and partial. Theophilus might inflict a tardy vengeance on the assassins of Leo and the saviours of his father, but he enjoyed the fruits of their crime, and his jealous tyranny sacrificed a brother and a prince to the future safety of his life. A Persian, of the race of the Sassanides, died in poverty and exile at Constantinople, leaving only a son, the issue of a plebeian marriage. At the age of twelve years, the royal birth of Theophobius was revealed, and his merit was not unworthy of his birth. He was educated in the Byzantine palace, a Christian and a soldier, advanced with rapid steps in the career of fortune and glory, received the hand of the emperor's sister, and was promoted to the command of thirty thousand Persians, who, like his father, had fled from the Mohammedan conquerors. These troops, doubly infected with mercenary and fanatic vices, were desirous of revolting against their benefactor, and erecting the standard of their native king. But the loyal Theophobius rejected their offers, disconcerted their schemes, and escaped from their hands to the camp or palace of his royal brother. A generous confidence might have secured a faithful and able guardian for his wife and his infant son, to whom Theophilus, in the flower of his age, was compelled to leave the inheritance of the empire. But his jealousy was exasperated by envy and disease. He feared the dangerous virtues which might either support or oppress their infancy and weakness. And the dying emperor demanded the head of the Persian prince. With savage delight he recognised the familiar features of his brother. "'Thou art no longer Theophobius,' he said, and, sinking on his couch, he added, with a faltering voice, "'Soon, too soon, I shall be no more Theophilus.'" End of chapter 48, part 2